George Bernard Shaw said, the quote has been used since you, since you see things, you, you look at the world as it is and ask why, and I dream of the world as it might be and ask why not. Do you and I think. Right to be recorded? Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> that's going to be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you could say that's the kind of thing you want to say as an engineer, right? Is it not? The, the dictionary definition of an engineer. I'm in a room full of, I guess, engineers, various other people, but engineers. But it's interesting, do you really know what an engineer is? And the dictionary definition of an engineer is a person who's scientific training and who designs and builds complicated products, machines, systems, or structures. We found a different definition from the urban dictionary definition, which I really like. <laughs> a kick-ass uber genius with godly math and science abilities, the training for which being at the expense of those abilities for spelling and talking to members of the opposite sex. You know that you're an engineer if you can prove it mathematically. I love that. I think it says everything. But what is really an engineer? An engineer for me is a really lovely quote from this book, A Beginner's Guide to Engineering, which is a fantastic book, actually, and one I've used many times. The engineer is a mediator between the philosopher, the working mechanic, and like an interpreter between two foreigners must understand the language of both. Hence, the absolute necessity of possessing both practical and theoretical knowledge. An engineer has a whole series of different roles, and what I'm going to do is describe what I do through those roles, and they're some very varied. Occasionally, it's possible as an engineer to be a magician. We did a project with a man called Mark Quinn, his baby, Luca. It was a scan of his baby, and he wanted to create a sculpture from his baby. So we took this baby, understanding the kind of nature of three-dimensional objects and how you design them and analyze them. Needed to, so we sliced the baby up. We sliced them up in little pieces and created these kind of, this, this form which could, we could analyze, which actually did something else. It allowed the, kind of, the guys manufacturing it to recreate the form of the baby at, at a larger scale. You work on all sorts of things. We had to see, if we're going to transport this baby in one go, how the baby moves around on the back of a truck. You have to think about so many different things, so many different criteria. Here, the little baby's bum folds out, it's okay. You have to get it, all these things considered. It was built in, in, um, in Spain by Factor Marte, by a company who are quite incredible at the work they do. But they took those slices, put the baby back together, as you can see here, created the whole of the baby. This is now to be built from bronze. This is Mark Quinn's request. But because it's such a kind of large object, the bronze to create it as a single shell surface was, would have been quite heavy and very difficult to work, very heavy, even heavier to move. So what we did was put inside this kind of spine which allowed the body to sit and each of the individual parts, the legs and the arms and the head to sit with the kind of stiffness of those, able to do what it is in very thin elements of bronze. So we put it together, each of the pieces of the bronze, and put the spine down the middle, wrapped the whole thing up, stuck it on the back of a truck, and then dropped it into Chatsworth House, where they sat it on its hand. And this thing that weighs 10 and a half tons, 11 tons, looks like it weighs nothing. So, it, it, and, and now, when you see it, it really does appear to kind of defy gravity somehow. We've worked a lot with artists over the period, and, and it's really interesting kind of having a, 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 working with somebody who has a singular goal and a very kind of direct view of what they want, unlike in architecture, which tends to kind of meander and move around in buildings. This project for Cloudgate, for Anish Kapoor, which is a 22-meter long sculpture. He gave us this, a model of this object about this big and said, make this work. And we took the idea of the structure for it, the same as the idea for Planet. We stole it, basically, from the Statue of Liberty, which has an iron structure up the inside and the skin is copper when it was built as copper. And because they expand and contract separately in the heat, they were connected together by leather connections which allowed them to breathe. And we used the same idea. So we have an internal structure in the sculpture and connected by these arms, which are sort of flexible, and the ends of them were made by a very kind of modern equivalent of rubber. But it allowed this movement because the sculpture 
when it was in place, the sun on the direct surface, the upper surface, the, te the, the, the temperature of the surface above could reach 20 degrees different to the surface beneath. So the thing had to be able to breathe. So we allowed, had this internal structure that suspended it and it kind of did that. And it allowed the kind of structure to effectively move and expand and contract separately. It was built by a, a guy we'd worked with on Pink Floyd before down in uh, Oakland in, in San, near San Francisco. He bought the uh, second of two only six axis milling machines off Boeing at the time to build it. And we used aircraft tolerances for the skin of the surface because the intention was eventually when this object appeared, it appeared like a single surface. It was delayed, so when it actually finally arrived into Chicago where it was, it appeared like this. And if you look very closely, you can see the sink. You can see the seams, and so then they covered it up for a year, polished it for a whole year, and then when they took it out, you cannot see anything. Remarkable piece. Really interestingly, we, we've been approached by somebody recently who's working on a, on, a, on, a, on a thesis on this work, and interesting how it included 21st century technology with craftsmen who were the people who developed the material, the techniques to polish the steel. So what's fantastic about it is in, the, in this kind of work as well is applying all these different technologies and different, different areas of profession. Sometimes what's great about being an engineer is the opportunity to be a kid, again, a schoolboy, and be able to think about things you never thought about. And uh, the same artist who had the idea, who's the baby, Planet, which is his, his child, Luca, he had the idea, he said to me, Neil, one day, he said, Neil, can you make a rainbow? And I said, I don't know. But, but the great thing about being an engineer, I think, is the opportunity when somebody says, can you do something, is to think, well, let's have a go. I, I don't know if you could or not. But what was great about it is going back to school, back to college, to find out a little more about optics, to understand how it worked. Aristotle was the first person who explained rainbows properly. You need three things for a rainbow, the observer, light, and water. And interestingly, all together, they have to be in a particular way. I, I, whether you realize or not, you have, the sun has to be behind you when you see a rainbow because it's the light that goes across you parallel and hits the water and reflect, uh, re refracts in, refracts off the back and refracts out again. And then that gives you this arc, which is roughly 42 degrees, depending upon the frequency of the light. So that's why you get rainbow, because the slight arc is very slightly different. So that's why it breaks down into the colors. And the reason you don't see a full circle is because the other half is under the ground, because you're standing on the, effectively on the, on the ground, that, which is the plane at which the thing is formed, because you are the observer, the person on the ground. We did it in Liverpool in a shed, Camel Laird, where they were, the shipbuilding industry had collapsed. And it was empty, so to be able to put something in there was amazing, to be able to work with these people making this stuff. So there's a wall of water, which I say in one, a wall of water is simple, but it took a hell of a long time to get the water right so it would do what we needed it to do because the droplets need to be particular distribution, particular size. Light, the light, we have to represent the sun, done with parallel light, so in parabolic reflectors. And then when you walked up to the front of the thing and you got to a particular point, you reached this 42 degree cone and there was a rainbow with you. Is that the way, it did, is that what engineers do? They do even more things sometimes that go beyond the call of duty. And I would say the role in the project that we did with Rachel Whiteread, I played the role of midwife which is not one I'm used to really, but uh, it was one that I enjoyed. She had come up with this project, uh, Ghost, which was the kind of uh, casting of the inside of a room. And she did it by casting a series of pieces and then putting them together on an armature and created the volume of the space. She wanted to do it with a house. We found the house with, through Art Angel. Will also recommended us to work on this project. They found a house in the middle of Victoria Park, which just the remains, just a single house in the middle of these three properties. And they paid the guy who was living there, they bought him a new house. More money went on buying the guy a new house than did on the project. 
But that was the thing. So, so it begins this kind of story. How do you create the internal volume of each of these rooms? If we'd taken the method she'd used, it would have taken two years probably. And we had six months because they agreed planning permission and that it had to be done and built and they had three months when it could be shown effectively and then it had to be taken away. So we came up with an idea which was to spray the inside surface of the house with concrete using a technique called gunniting, spraying. So we reinforced the inside of the house out. That's Rachel there. And then you spray the surface and create this kind of shell of concrete inside, which is 12 centimeters thick. And when you strip away the building, the brickwork, and the facade of the building, you create these volumes, these spaces, which are, she said, was the kind of representation of memory. And the project became huge, actually. It was on the front of every national paper at the time. She won the Turner Prize for this project. And it brought up this conversation about house, home. And it was in the east of London, and they were knocking down a lot of houses at the time and have continued to do so. And so this kind of debate came about housing. But technically, it was unbelievable. We did it with, with um, Tarmac, their spraying division. When they sprayed, when we removed it, the kind of detail was incredible. The kind of door locks, the doors, the fireplaces. But even more remarkable, this is the texture on the wallpaper. When they pulled the stuff away, you get the texture of the concrete of the wallpaper. Incredible. As I said, Charles Sarchi offered to buy it. Various people offered to kind of pay for it to stay, but they wouldn't let it stay. And it was really it was kind of a very disappointing thing, I think, to watch it be crushed. And so what was a kind of great monument to memory and family and home and all the rest of it, was, which sat there in Victoria Park, looks like that. Very disappointing things to happen, I think. We, I, I, um, when I first started, uh, after I left working with Ian, actually, I worked for Anthony Hunt Associates, and I became known as Membrane Man. And Taylor membranes are kind of big thing in our lives. Membrane structures are quite... This is interesting. This is a project in Doncaster, uh, in Gateshead, which is the... Um, the, uh, the it became the... Baltic Gallery. And this is the building that we had, which was a, a flour mill, and the requirements to retain the facades. And the idea was to take out the inside of the building, which was a series of concrete shafts, and leave the facade and then build inside it this new gal art gallery. And during the demolitions, the head of the, the director of the gallery said, Sonny Nordgren said, let's put an installation into the building when it's complete because of three months between the completion of demolitions and beginning of the new build. And Anish had the idea, Anish Kapoor had the idea to kind of construct one of these kind of infinite holes he has. But the concrete, because of the foundations and the nature of the place, was so big that it would have taken months and months to do it. So we talked at length with him about it and the idea of installing something within the space, within the volume. And the easiest thing to do to create kind of something on scale, at scale, and something very powerful was to use fabric. So taking the kind of language of what Anish was doing and the kind of technical ability and knowledge we had of memory structures, we created this kind of form inside it, which had this incredibly... It was like two conics working together and suspended off eff effectively the structure that was supporting the walls from the outside. But it had this really bizarre effect. In the building, it kind of distorted the space. It kind of foreshortened everything because of the nature of the space. But you see what's interesting here. The weight of the, of the object, of the, of the building, and the kind of lightness of the surface. We went on with Ellis Williams, who were the architects, to complete the Baltic Gallery, and, it's very, and we continue to work with them now. And artists find more and more difficult ways to do things that we have to kind of work with within the building. But they took the membrane inside that building that we did temporarily, rolled it up in a bag, and then, I don't know, 12 months later said, we're going to take it somewhere else. And we took it to Naples, and you can see here, it's there in the town square in the centre of Naples. We shifted the place. So it's, great, it's great about membrane. They put it in a bag. And the scale is 40 metres long, this thing. And put it in... But what's interesting, and when I teach sometimes, 
and Calvino always comes up as a kind of as somebody as a reference. And Calvino has a, a, a book called Six Memos for the Next Millennium. And one of the essays in it is called Lightness. And he talks about the nature of context and weight and the way you design, that actually you could change the nature of an object by the context it's in. So in, in the previous image, when you saw it inside this very heavy concrete building, it, the lightness is in the object. Here, the lightness is in the structure supporting it, and the weight is in the object, the way you perceive it. I said, um, schoolboy, and, and, and actually sometimes it gets even more as a child. <coughs> we were invited by James May, uh, uh, and a series called uh, Toy Stories? I can't remember what it's called. Um, to create a house, out, a full-size house out of Lego. And uh, I don't really need to say any more. He can say it, so I'll just show this little bit of film. It's <coughs> a joy that simply never diminishes. It is the world's premier rapid-fire reusable constructional medium. Over 300 billion of these have been produced. And for what? <coughs> this? I think we can do better. Right, I'm confident that it works. Look at this. <coughs> I'm now going upstairs in a Lego house. This is just fantastic. I thought we might manage a bungalow or a beach hut or something, but look at this. The first floor. Look at the stripes, it's just... I mean, all heads, it should look like this. It's so cheerful. Look at my carpet. Beautiful. Um, and... Uh, I, I said earlier on that the, 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 each of the individual projects you do, they have set criteria that you work with, and they will, they will direct the nature of what you do. And one of those things as an engineer I think you need to know is have an ability to understand building, how things go together. And that's n never more kind of clear to me than when we're working on the st stage sets that we've worked on for... 25 years, and initially with Mark Fisher, who unfortunately died half a dozen years ago. But Mark was my introduction to this world, and um, it has been an amazing world, and continues to be, actually. We first worked on Pink Floyd um, in San Francisco, and I mentioned that the guy who built the sculpture for Anish Kapoor was the guy who worked on this project here. And it's really interesting how those relationships continue to evolve, which is something I really love. I was very close to Mark, and, and it, it, a lot of the relationships that I have had with colleagues of his have continued on since. Here, he did something that nobody had done before. Standard stage sets used to be kind of PA system stage with a roof light done. But he changed it. He said, take those standard components and put them together in a different way. So the Pink Floyd, he did this big arch. And the rock and roll industry is really clever, actually. I, I had thought when I first joined that kind of world that they were all doing drugs, and, did it, and they're not. It's nothing like that. This is a lighting truss system. But what they do is lose the third face, which is really clever, because when you're moving stuff around between one show and another, and you're doing 100 tour shows in a tour, you want to pack as much stuff in a truck as you can, because you don't want to transport air. That's money. So... Very clever to lose the third. It means they stack easily. And so the lighting trusses are done that way. The, 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 the guy, the, the Ethan Silva, his name is, he built the mirror ball, which was at the time the biggest mirror ball in the world. And this is kind of representative of Pink Floyd and the kind of nature of the show they do. Anonymous, but the show is the most important thing.
It was a quite a nice introduction to rock and roll. I've got to tell you, three months in San Francisco was Pink Floyd, with Pink Floyd was pretty cool. <laughs> we did. The Rolling Stones, uh, a number of sets for the Rolling Stones. This is called Bridges to Babylon. Very different kind of show. The screen in the middle is all about Mick Jagger. It's a, it's a, they're all about the band as well as the music. But it's called Bridges to Babylon, and Mark had this idea to build a bridge <clears throat> that would lift from the stage and extend to a little stage in the middle, and you'd have a nice, intimate little concert with 100,000 people and the Rolling Stones from the middle of the stadium. And this idea, we, when, 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 when he had the idea, we had 20 weeks or something until the show had to start in North America, and we took it to the fire brigade in West London and said, who build you know, ladders for fire engines and said, how long do you need to do this? And they said, two years. <coughs> so, like 17, 18 weeks into it, two weeks before we ship the thing to go on tour, we put it out and it broke. Broke. 43 meters long, this thing is, this cantilever. It broke. And we were five, six shows into the tour, and at this point... I'm now on first name terms with the Rolling Stones lawyers. Right. Not the healthiest place I've ever been. And um, thankfully, the people who build this brilliant stages, and I, get, I say about the people building, working with these builders, you know, it's about a team. And rock and roll, it's particularly clear, very, very clear, that everybody works together for the same end. It's that adage, the show must go, and it's absolutely true in this industry. It, I always say, in the rock and roll industry, if you have a problem, everybody gets together and fix it, fixes it. In the building industry, if you have a problem, people write a letter. It's a very different approach. So the thing I had to drive in, you can't take these things apart. I mean, they're driven, there's loads of kind of connect, electrical connections and, and data connections. They have to kind of move as one. So it's designed to be able to transport on its own vehicle. It drives itself into the set, sits down, and is connected into the back of the stage. And then... At one point, the stage opens, and it lifts and drives out. We were now eight shows into the tour. It's called Bridges to Babylon, and there's no bridge. We arrive in Atlanta. I turn up in Atlanta with the bridge when it arrives, and thank God, they quite liked it. So... It carried on and toured, and it was pretty successful, actually. I've had, a with Mark, a, a very long relationship with YouTube. I mean, we worked on Zoo TV, and, um, and then but, but the biggest one that we did up until this point was Pop Mart. And the amazing thing about Pop Mart, a, a sort of comment on, on consumerism, was the use of a, a commercially available blue LED, which changed the nature of LED screens. So it meant they could create an LED screen the full size of the stage. And at this point, I mean, Pink Floyd was the same, but it became very clear again on, on, on U2, the stages are so big. And this, uh, because you're traveling with 250 people on a tour, 250 crew, the money involved is so big that actually... This, that you and I, is the bit you and I don't see that supports the bit you do. This is the steel set, and in front of it is the thing called Universal. There is only one of Universal, because that's the expensive, very expensive bit. The LED screen, the PA system, the arch, which is a kind of joke about McDonald's. The thing about it is that there are now three of those, Three steel sets traveling the world at the same time, leapfrogging one another. So when the band are playing one night in one show in one city, in another city they're building the steel set to prepare. So when they load out the universal part, one, it loads out overnight, loads in the next day, 24 hours later they play. 250 people, remember, this is huge money. So we started using uh, composites, lightweight composites, because anything you do to improve the crew's life, the crew love you. And it makes money because it means it's quick, easy, light. So you use a basic steel frame, same as we did the, the, the Pink Floyd thing, just configured in a slightly different way. And then you put this kind of skin on it. And the LED screen, which is genius, designed by a man called Frederick Opsema, came up with the idea 
of how to put an LED screen together. Because remember, every single pixel has to have electric and data to it. So every single connection has to be made every single time you arrive on a set. So how do you do that when you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of pixels? Well, he had this idea, like a pack of cards, you stack them and they turn up on a dolly like this, which again, remembering this fits into a trailer, and you, they are hinged, so you pull them apart. So they're already all data connected. Every single strip is there fully connected. The screen, 70 meters across, is a big, big wall. And so when we looked at the kind of density of the LEDs to create the effect they wanted to do, we were able to put space between each of the LED sections. And so the majority of the screen is now transparent to wind, meaning everything beyond that, all the structure behind it is now lighter and cheaper, easier, less weight to carry. I mean, we're talking about 20, 40 foot trucks now to move this stuff around. And the effect was of a surface, a screen. The biggest, and, and probably Mark, in terms of rock and roll, his, his ambition was to build a single bespoke set. And he did it with U2, and it was probably the most amazing set I've ever worked on, I think, called U2 360. And it was designed so that you could fill a stadium. Because most shows are stadium end, and so 30% of the seats you cannot use. So the idea here, whether you see it cynical or not, was to fill the stadium. And so you create a, a kind of claw which sits in the middle of the stadium and the audience sits around it so the show is in full 360 degrees. This is actually in Werchter, which is a place in Belgium. Um, the guy who runs the staging company happens to be the mayor of Werchter, which helps when you want to build shit in your backyard, right? <laughs> so that's what he did. This is it in Berlin sat in place and I have a little film which shows the, the 48 hours of installation show and and then the, the loadout
Um, I told you there are three steel sets. There are three claws that exist. Somebody's just bought one. And um, this is a porch to his, his aquarium he owns in Atlanta. He's just built it. But, so you, you, you can buy one. There's still one available. $100,000 it is to buy if you want it. But it costs $6.5 million to put it in place. <laughs> so <laughs> probably might think twice. I, I, I said I've continued to work in the rock and roll industry, and I do, with, still with Stu Fish, and after Mark's passing, Ray Winkler now runs it, and we still conti continue to work with them. But also, as Devlin, we've become involved with. Um, as amazing designer, and we work with her on Take That on a piece of work which I really love, called the Om Man. And this is a kind of machine that comes out from behind the stage, sits up, and then eventually stands up in the middle of the stadium. And it, for me, is, is a perfect example where, it, with a very limited amount of time, all these technologies, all these kind of techniques of construction come together. Because this man is going to do all sorts of things, light, move, hydraulics, you know, electrical actuation. And so you need to think about all the things, every single step of it. So when he's folded up to travel, he's on the back of a truck on a trailer because you can't I tell you, disconnect all the data and electrics. So the guy, Andy Edwards, the mechanical engineer we worked with at the time, he was a rock and roll engineer, he came up with the idea of how to go about putting this thing together. Buy a standard trailer, take a crane, boom, turn it upside down. There's the base of the man, the spine. That's the base of his, those two things, they're the base of his spine. It had to sit on the back of the trailer and slide because the motions he had to go through meant it couldn't be static and fixed. When... The man is traveling, lying down, the profile of wind is small. But when he's standing up 25 meters in the air doing that, the wind is profile is very high. So we had the wheels for traveling on the road and then a whole different set of wheels that you attach when you arrive in a show. So now he begins to take shape, the spine, the shoulders and the arms. And for some weird, bizarre reason, Andy decided he would drive the man from the belly. <laughs> Whatever. And, and so that's him there with the various controls sitting in this map, testing it, taking it through his motions. That's it, ready to travel. And one, one of the things, and, and Ez has particularly shown me this happen, but when, the, the, the thing is, this is his hand and his forearm, kind of a bit of, kind of crappily painted fiberglass, not particularly well done, looks all right, but not that great. But when you see it in the context of what it is, it becomes something else. It's kind of, it's great theater. The, the band, for their, whatever reasons, decided they would come out on the man as it came out from beyond the stage. And it did various, then it dropped off and sang to it. Andy Edwards, he all, I'm afraid, he died shortly after this project. After he'd done the whole tour, he died of a heart attack. And um, he, as I said, was one of the most amazing engineers I ever worked with. Working in that world led on to um, Olympics, working in shows, big shows. And we were, we were the overseeing engineers for the London Olympics. Um, and working with people from all over, it was amazing, actually working with all, uh, with all sorts of different people. But creating this stage, I mean, the scale of, of it is such that you couldn't, couldn't be any one company, and that's what's amazing about these types of events. Again, the way they integrate everybody together. I mean, this set, this is the stage you're looking at here, and, um, and the, the, the idea here was a representation of the, 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 the age of uh, the Victorian uh, Industrial Revolution. So 
these things which represent kind of chimney stacks come out of the ground, already inflated, so they appear to be rock solid when they're coming out. All these kind of techniques you start to think about, how things go together, how they work. 72 Mary Poppinses <laughs> suspended from a flying system that you don't even really see because it's wires so thin that they hardly appear. You hardly notice them. And the big deal in any of these big shows, the Olympics, is the Olympic rings, when the Olympic rings come together. And for this, um, Danny Boyle and his team had the idea that they wanted it to appear like molten metal, and they kind of mold these things and they come together and form the rings. So this is flown in from above the stadium roof and it appears, forms the Olympic ring shape, and then bang, the money shot is when the fireworks go off the, the, um, the one moment that everything has to work. <laughs> in, in, shortly after this, we worked on the most expensive opening ceremony for any Olympics ever, which is in Sochi in Russia, which is for a Winter Olympics. And it, it, this, is when, this is just before the show is about to go on late. Can anybody see any snow? No, of course. Because it was 30 <laughs> degrees, right? 30 degrees. It was the strangest idea. This stadium, when we arrived, didn't have this bit and this bit and this bit. We spent $120 million, million putting that in to deliver the show before we even started a show. Amazing. It built nine tracks, half a kilometre each, nine hundred, so four and a half kilometres, five kilometres of track, each having five, two and a half tonne winches that went backwards and forwards the whole time to deliver this amazing show, which this is the... It went from end to end, and it was all set up in Putin, for Putin's seat. I sat in that seat, actually. You weren't supposed to, but I did. And, and was able to sit there and kind of watch the thing go by. Not while he was there, by the way. But I watched the show go by, and it was all centered around him. And this is the idea of representation of time zones in Russia. Nine, Russia has nine time zones, which is amazing. I didn't know that. These things are 30 meters across. Every single piece is massive. So we go through the history of Russia, the Troika and the Sun, each of these doing all sorts of kind of this motions, really complicated stuff. They spent millions. They actually spent 400 million on a show, the history of Russia. And the idea for the, the moment, the, the rings moment, the Olympic rings moment, was that it was like snowflakes that came from different directions and they kind of looked like snowflakes until they came together in the shape of the Olympic rings and then they do what they're supposed to do. Unfortunately, if you saw it on the night of the opening ceremony of the Olympics, one of them didn't do what it was supposed to do <laughs> and it didn't open. And, and the thing about in the, this world is if anything goes wrong, anything doesn't work exactly the way, you cannot use pyrotechnics because you don't know the effect of the pyrotechnics on the particular thing that's gone wrong, and therefore you're not allowed to use any of them. So what happened here was you got four rings open and no money shot. So that's what, if you and I watched that, if you were in Russia, this is what you watched. Two days before, I was at production rehearsals and watched this. <laughs> and then you get, boom, the big money shot. So every show that you ever work on has a delay between record and transmission for that very reason. $400 million worth of show and the one moment when it didn't work. Sometimes it's not all about money. In return to you two, now with theirs, actually, so having taken over from Mark, this is U2's Joshua Tree Tour, where they've got a 4K LED screen, same size as the Pop Mart screen, but the kind of quality of it is just incredible. And we are looking at LED screens that from the work we were doing in Rolling Stones and Pink Floyd, where they are, the grain is very, very large grain, 350 kilograms a square meter down to 12 kilograms a square meter, now the LED screens. And the set... So remember, we've got now 4K screens. The data <coughs> transmission and connections are made by that one connection now that he does. Every panel. That's it. These guys love, I tell you one. 
they, 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 the thing goes in in no time. I've started, I've, when they were playing in Twickenham, I went with Ian, Richie actually, we were there watching this show, they were playing chess. The crew were playing chess in the back, on, the back, on the stage, just because the thing goes together so quickly. Jake Berry, the production manager, who is the best production manager on the planet, and was paid some outrageous sum of money by the Rolling Stones not to tour with somebody else because they wanted him to wait for them, he said, for the first time in my career, I was able to load out before sunrise. That's a big deal. And the, the quality of the screen... What we did, the most important thing here, is we developed a screen which incorporated its own structure. And the structure was a carbon fiber structure and it unfolds. When the screen is dropped into place, it unfolds to create the structure. So suddenly you have a screen that's kind of uh, capable of withstanding the forces and you need relatively small amount of structure to support it. It was, um, it was such a great project to work on, and well, the, actually, most of the officers here, uh, I tell you, want to see it. And what was great about it is we entered it and won the award from the Institution of Structural Engineers for Innovation in 2018. And um, what was great is Aaron, my partner, and I couldn't be there to take the award, but we agreed that everybody from the who was at the award ceremony, the table of 10 would go up and collect the award. And, and what's incredible about this picture is we have more technical, female technical staff than we do male. Not by intention, it's just happened that way. And, and you know, we have a, uh, our employment policy is we'll employ anybody if they're any good. And, and so I, right now I'd like to say, because they're there and they're there sat in front of me, thank you to my office. <laughs> So, you two, three, six, you two, Joshua Tree, what do you do after you've built a full 4K screen, 70 metres across, 20 metres high, whatever it is, Jay-Z and Beyonce, they want to do something, what are they going to do? What are you going to do that's bigger and better than that? Well, of course, there's two of the biggest egos on the planet, and they find something to do that's bigger and better, because everybody has to do that thing. This is their screen, I think, on the run tour two, on the run two, I think the tour is called... And what do they do that's bigger? Here's the screen. You make a screen that moves. So the screen opens to reveal another stage. And it's very famous, this, this, this is a kind of take on a, a thing that happened. I don't know whether you're aware of it, whether it's popular culture, but Solange, slapped Jay-Z around the head in a, in a lift, in an elevator, which made the news a, a couple of years ago. And this is a take on that show. But the thing about making that kind of joke is occasionally that joke backfires. So they come down this elevator, but every once in a while, the elevator didn't work. <laughs> and unfortunately, <laughs> she doesn't very happy, right? <laughs> so Jay, so, so Beyonce is pretty pissed off. So bigger and better, is not always best. I, I, one of the, the projects that I've worked on in my life, which is probably the most fantastic project, is Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. Patrick Belly is here from Atelier 10, who has been my friend, and we've worked together since we were together at Bureau Hapo a long, long time ago with Ian, who's about there, 30 years ago, something like that. But it was, um, it was awarded... Um, 
World Building of the Year in 2012 by Paul Finch. For the, 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 he was the director of the chair. The, he was the chairman of the, the jury. And he said he awarded the architecture prize to all the four design team members, the architect, the landscape architect, the structural engineer, and the environmental engineer, <coughs> saying that it was the most collaborative project he had ever seen. And <coughs> I have to say, it was, one of, it was one of the greatest projects I've ever worked on, but I don't mean to say a great deal about it because David Attenborough can say it. Which, interestingly, brings me to the future. I, what now? You know, what, where am I going? I, I have three daughters. Um, Sonia, unfortunately, my wife, couldn't make it tonight because of our daughter looking after the children. These are my three daughters, but they could be any three daughters. Right? It could be these children or these children. Or these, or these. And the point is, we, as engineers, and whatever the other professions are here, have to think a lot about the world. We are, the building industry is a part of the problem we're creating. We know that. And I've shown you a lot of stuff which is, you know, you might consider to be frivolous and worthless and energy guzzling and the rest of it. But I think maybe it's time to, to think about that. This is a piece from Dezine recently. Architects should give up concrete as experts at Architecture of Emergency Climate Summit. Let's fill our cities with taller wooden buildings. Bamboo transcends the tropics for carbon negative construction. We've been involved in timber projects for a long time and I think become more and more involved. This is a shed at Hook Park with AA where we took timber thinnings, which is something that goes way back to when I worked at Bureau Happold and working with Fry Otto and Aaron's Burton Karolek on some of the projects that we were doing down there. Timber thinnings. Aaron, my partner, did this project. It's a, it uses a kind of technique of connection that had not been done before. And so because it doesn't appear in the codes, we load tested it. That's how it was checked for what it did. So these kind of random touches develop with the AA. And the AA did this, they have done this project, which is not my project, or Atelier One's project, but a project I think is amazing. And I want to show you, because we take timber and we strip it and cut it and make it kind of square. But what they would, they would have been talking about is the idea, well, why don't you take a look at the way the trees are? They've got 100 acres of trees down there. Why don't you look at them and scan the trees and see how you can put the bits together? So take a piece of a tree, scan it, this kind of branch thing, and take the branch. Don't do anything else with it. But what you do is apply 21st century technology and create, you put various pieces together, and by the way you machine the connections, the, the, the interfaces, you don't actually have to make any further connections. So they build in place a truss which is built from elements of trees. You haven't done anything except bark it, strip it off. So, this thing is the, one of the most recent buildings they've built, but I think it's really amazing as a kind of idea of the use of timber without wastage of timber. I wish we'd done it, but I love that it exists. This, my, I mentioned my partner, Aaron. Um, he and I have been partners for 25 years. This is a project. He, he particularly is involved in the, element, the side of timber. This is a tower we developed with Richard Rogers and Partners, which is a can only timber building. In fact, and all the connections are carbon. This is a concept project, not built. But we are currently working <coughs> on this project. British Pavilion for um, Expo, which is built from Timber CLT, with Ez Devlin, interestingly, who is the third person in a row to win the design of the British Pavilion, who is not an architect, interestingly. And then bamboo, um, I've kind of, and we as an office have become interested in bamboo, and the idea that you take bamboo and the natural calm and treat it and create engineered bamboo, much like you do CLT, cross-laminated timber. I think we all know. So engineered bamboo. There are a number of bamboo <coughs> materials available, but this one that we found in, in the America has incredible properties. 
And interestingly, it has far better charring properties than do the best timber products like Baobuk, CLT. So it chars a lot less. So the idea of looking at bam bamboo is, without question, the most sustainable building material on the planet. There's a bridge built in China, which is over an existing stone bridge, but they created this kind of cladding. It's a sort of sculptural project, but it is durable, externally used, sun-resistant bamboo. And that same company I'm talking about, they are putting together something they call radial bamboo, radially laminated bamboo, where they take the bamboo comb, unfold it, and so they use 80% of the comb, 80% of the element that, of the, the thing that's planted in the structure. That's kind of more akin to the idea of the timber world we're working, but it was for me, five years ago, Mark Fisher sent me to meet this man, Mark Fisher was about to die and he said, go meet John Hardy. John Hardy runs a thing in Bali called the Green School. This is the Green School. It is a school built entirely of bamboo, no walls, no windows. And, and it is one of the most amazing places I've ever visited and I've continued to visit there ever since. This is the central space built from bamboo. Natural columns now we're working with. These are not engineered. These are taking the columns and forming them and creating structures from them. They create the most incredible spaces. You can build six-story houses from bamboo. This is a house designed and, and built by the company, designed by John's daughter. <coughs> I, John's son started this thing through via the green school called Bamboo U, which is a, a, a course on design of bamboo, which they run every three or four months. And I go and I teach there with the students. I've been learning about bamboo for a long time, but I've only, we've only relatively recently started engineering it throughout because to understand the material of its nature, it, it takes a long time. I have realized that actually in all the time I've been an engineer, I never really built anything. But in Bali, I'm building stuff. I'm making things myself. It's great. It's really enlightening to actually get your hands on stuff. I mean, I've been there on sites and building sites. I spent two years in the Middle East building concrete buildings, but you don't do it yourself. We built this for the bamboo. You recently, there's a kitchen. I mean, the structure of it's clad in copper tiles, and the internal structure is kind of bamboo cones. This is the but called the Bamboo Hall, which we did with Jörg Stamm, who's known as the prophet of bamboo. He lives, he's from Germany, but lives in Colombia and built all over the world and just recently won a very major award for sustainable building. And he had the idea of combining a series of high paths together, built from Bav's relatively small bamboo combs to create this building, the thing they call the Bamboo Hall, which is a teaching space. And they built it themselves as students. I was with them, we were, we were building these things together. And we've begun to investigate the idea of three-dimensional shape, surface you know, uh, uh, geometric stiffness and using shape, so using thin members. Like we do in all other materials, but to be able to work with it in a place where they just kind of pull them together and make these things. This is part of a hotel, Bamboo Inder, which John Hardy, the man who, who owns and started the Green School also, house, and if you get a chance to go to Bali, go here, Bamboo Inda it's called, it's an amazing place. And more recently, getting bigger, so this is a badminton court using bamboo in three-dimensional form. <laughs> York Stam built my favorite bamboo structure, this is called Three Mountains, which used, he, I describe him as the friato of bamboo. He kind of combines the whole technique. So this, these central columns are these toroidal things, and the members hanging off them are all in tension. You can see that to create the roof surfaces. So it's a combination of all sorts of techniques. So bamboo is remarkable like that. As an office, we've been looking at ideas. Like the thing about if you look into it, anybody's interested after this, you'll find the thing like wood, the big deal is connections because it's very weak in shear. So we've been looking at the, a way of making a new type of connection to, to fool bamboo into thinking it's continuous. It's kind of really interesting. And we stole the idea from the children where gumshoe is for coffee. 
And so you take up the kind of major variation in the thing itself and you do this kind of gum in between to take up the local thing. So these you roll canals, because bamboo is not the same. You need to think about it in a different way. It's possible then to start doing things that were done 40 years ago. Ian, sorry, I have to do it again. I think Ian was probably very involved in this. I visited this recently, actually. Unbelievable. Bamboo, you can do all sorts. Yeah. It's quite remarkable. You can even build your own mobile home. <laughs> and so, what happened to the rock and roll thing, right? What happened? See, the, the, this is the future now I'm talking about. So, 30, 40 years ago, this used to be rock and roll. Just a bunch of scaffolding tarps and all sorts, and then you get UT360, super sophisticated, 200 people travelling. PA systems 30 years ago that weighed 20 tonnes now weigh one. Lighting from park hands and stuff, now LEDs. Don't weigh nothing, no energy, hardly any energy, energy use at all. The LED screens I mentioned used to weigh 350 kilograms a square metre, now weigh 12. Do you know what hasn't changed? Steelwork. This is 1994, travelling 300 tonnes of steelwork for one set. So, and remember I said to you there are three? There's 1,000 tonnes of steelwork that's travelling the world, right? In 2018, the steelwork weighs 300 tonnes. How? 900 tonnes of staging is 45 trucks touring 3.5 million miles. 425,000 gallons of fuel, 3,800 tons of CO2. We took Madonna's MDMA, MDNA tour <laughs> every flippy time. <laughs> MDNA tour and took the structure they used and we converted it to a cable assisted system and reduced it to less than a third of the weight. Same structure, same set, does the same job. So, we are beginning the conversations now about how to change the nature of touring structures to reduce all those things I'm talking about. And if you want an example of what I'm talking about, recently, the Green School in Bali, we were invited to work on a Green School in New Zealand, and we've done some work on a Green School in Cape Town. The Green School in New Zealand, this, this is the landscape, untouched, going up. But it's unbelievably beautiful. And what John Hardy said is, don't go in and push the, get the bulldozers in to dig the ground up. And so we came up with the idea, well, why dig the ground up? Why not put it above the ground? So the idea here is to suspect that everything continues to grow and the sheep continue to graze underneath. The school exists in a net above it. This week, I'm finishing now, right? This week, I, on Thursday, I am attending a meeting in the morning uh, for Ponti Casilti Aqueduct. Does anybody speak Welsh? No. Okay. Ponti Casilti Aqueduct. This, we, we entered a competition and we, were sh we won the competition, actually. Um, to, it's Telford built this 200 years ago. It's one of the first major projects Telford built. And it's remarkable, and he, the innovations involved. And they chose us because they said, they're kind of, I, I, it's kind of, kind of, they're kind of parallels, which is unbelievable. I mean, the idea to work on, on to look back 200 years of history and work on Telford structure now in the future for us is amazing. And... When I returned from that meeting on Thursday morning, I'd go to a meeting in Manchester, which is for the memorial for the bomb bombing of Manchester. I think, um, I think I wanted to just say one thing, actually. I've talked about my partner, Aaron. Aaron doesn't really get as much credit as I do. I think I'm the kind of face. And so I just want to say everything I've said tonight, I dedicate to him. He can't be here, he's actually in Italy. So I'd like to say, please, a round of applause for Aaron Chadwick. Yeah.